Amen. Amen. I love services like this where we get to celebrate with family and we get to celebrate the accomplishments of uh, young people uh, because it's a hard it's a hard task, especially today. Right. Uh, Today, I want to talk with everybody, uh, especially Austin and John. Where's John? I lost. There he is. Okay. especially with you two guys about finishing strong. Uh, This is something that God's really been putting on my heart and And I really hope that we all just receive this, uh, because even as I'm teaching it, uh, it's been speaking to me all week long, and I hope it speaks to me even further, uh, even as these words come out of my mouth. So if you have your Bible uh, with you, open up to 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 9, and as you're doing that, I'm going to just say a quick word of prayer. Uh, Father, thank you for giving us this day that we can celebrate with Austin and John as well as with their family and friends, I I humbly ask, Holy Spirit, use me today to share this message of encouragement and to challenge us each to live a day as if though we have finished strong. I admit, Father, that without you, I cannot do anything, but I know with you all things are possible. In Jesus' name, amen. Now you turn there, 1 Corinthians chapter 9. I'm going to be starting, I'm going to be looking at verse 24 and 25. One of my professors, uh, Reverend Johansson, made this statement. He said, life is not a hundred yard dash. It's not. It is, however, a long distance marathon. Think about that for just a moment. If life is not a quick dash, you know, like a quick dash to the fast food place to get something really fast. Life is not like that. In fact, when you think about going to that fast food restaurant, aren't you usually left, even after you've ate that meal, with a little dissatisfaction knowing that you could have had better? That if you had just planned a little bit better, you could have had a fresh meal with good, wholesome food. Your body would have loved you for it especially later, right? I heard that laugh back there. Who caught that? So we're going to look at verse 24 and 25. Keep in mind, this finishing strong is not just talking about the end of your life, okay? Even though as I go through this message and I'll give you some definitions, the definitions will really make you start thinking, well, isn't he really talking about the end end of our time? No, I'm talking about today, right now, each and every one of us, can challenge ourselves to live each day finishing it strong, okay? So keep that in mind. Let's read. Um, It says, don't, and I'm using the uh, NLT version, so Austin and John, you got a nice brand new NLT Bible. You guys, it's going to be your first time you get to use it, and I'm glad I'm going to get to be the first verse that you're using it with. So here we go. Don't you realize that in a race, everyone runs, but only one person gets the prize, So run to win. He didn't say run to lose. All athletes are disciplined in their training. They do it to win a prize that fades away. But we do it for a prize that has eternal. We do it for an eternal prize. So if life is not this 100-yard dash or this fast food experience, And it really is more like a marathon. The question should be then, how do we finish strong, right? How do we finish strong? Well, today I didn't bring any uh, beach balls or anything, but I want to have a race. And I'm going to, I was going to ask Austin and and John to come up here. And we're going to start a starting line. But I'm like, well, John didn't really dress appropriately for the occasion. So I'm like, well, we better not do that. Actually, I was just kidding, guys. I really wasn't going to make you run around the room. Although that would have been fun, right? That would have been in my, my normal way of doing something. But I do want to share this quick little story with you. It's about an athlete. His name is Derek Redman. Derek was born in September of 1965, and he's a retired British athlete. During his career, he held the British record for the 400-meter dash, uh, and he won gold medals in the 4 by 400 meter relay at the World Championships, European Championships, and the Commonwealth Games. At the 1992 Olympic Games in Barcelona, 
in the middle of a semifinal race, his dreams for an Olympic medal were crushed by a debilitating hamstring injury. While most athletes at this point would just give up, submit to defeat, bend over and cry, waiting for someone to come and stretcher them off the field, Derek did not. He was determined to cross the finish line. He wanted to finish what he started. So he picked himself up off the ground and started hobbling towards the finish line. Then, just when it seemed he might not be able to continue, because of the pain, I don't know if you've ever had a hamstring go out on you. It's, it's terrible pain. His father forces his way through the crowd. In fact, through security, through track officials, and runs up to his son, puts his arm around his son, and carries him to the finish line. Now, if this story sounds familiar, it should be, because it's a, it's a YouTube sensation right now. You can go on YouTube and see the story of Derek. When his father did that and they crossed the finish line, the crowd stood and cheered. The crowd stood and cheered. This incident has become a well-remembered moment in Olympic history, having been the subject of one of the International Olympic Committee's Celebrate Humanity videos. And it's also, been, uh, it's also used in advertisements by Visa as an illustration of the Olympic spirit and by Nike in their commercials that talk about courage. See, Derek finished his race. He didn't win a medal or an award for it, but he won the heart of the people in that stadium that day. He finished what he started. He finished strong. He may have finished in tears and in pain, but he finished. Did he finish his life at that moment? No. He finished that moment strong. And because he had the courage to press through, the perseverance to continue on, even when everyone else might have given up, he had the courage and the determination to press through. Guys, you are going to encounter times where it's going to be hard to press through. It's going to seem like everything is coming against you, but be determined to press through. And when all help, hope seems like it is, uh, loss, guess what? You have a dad. You have a physical dad sitting right next to you, but you also have a heavenly dad that you can call on, call on and count on at any time. So let's go back to the question. How do we finish strong? Well, first, I, I think before we can answer that question, let's look at some definitions. Steve Farrar in his book, Finishing Strong, defines four different kinds of finishes based on biblical leaders. The first finish is called cut, up, cut off early. These leaders, they were taken out of leadership. And there's several good examples. One of them is Absalom. You remember the story of Absalom? He tried to overthrow his father's kingdom. He got a lot of people persuaded to follow him uh, because he was a great talker, a great persuader. Uh, the Bible described him as having big hair. I don't know if you know anything about hair in the Bible, but when you, when you see references to hair, it usually talks about a person's pride. It talks about what their, their honor. Okay? Now, here's the thing about Absalom. In a battle, as he's trying to retreat for his life, his hair gets caught in a tree. Now he's dangling by his hair in a tree. And, of course, the soldiers came up, and they killed him. And if you read the story, you find out David was real, not real happy about that, even though Absalom, his son, was trying to take over and overthrow. This is a, this is a, a, a tragic story of being cut off early. Absalom didn't have to be cut off early. He made a choice. He made a choice to go against his father. And that's why he was cut off early. John the Baptist, another example of someone cut off early. Now, did John the Baptist do something wrong to be cut off early? No. In fact, he was absolutely doing the will of God. He didn't do anything other than what God told him to do. That's why he was out in the desert, dressed like he was, eating what he ate, calling for people to repent, calling for them. But he also knew that one day he was going to end up lower than Jesus, and this is that day. 
we know the story. King Herod had him beheaded. So, uh, as you can see, cut off early doesn't necessarily mean a bad thing, right? It could be. But in this case, if you're following God, then being cut off early is not so bad of, bad of a place to be. All right, number two, finishing poorly. Uh, they were going, they started strong, but then these leaders went downhill and downhill and just kept going downhill. Now, we talked about one of these heroes, Gideon. I'm not going to go into his story because I think we did a really great job exhausting his story, but he started strong and went downhill. Another, another great example of someone who started strong but went downhill fast and, and couldn't recover was Saul, the first king of Israel. Remember him? Uh, I remember uh, teaching this one to kids, and I, I remember in one of the videos that we showed how humble uh, Saul was. He, he really didn't want to be king. In fact, he hid, and, and he's like, no, I don't really want to accept this. And when, he, when everyone was like, you, you got to do it, you know, he finally agrees to this, and he starts off strong. He's a good leader. He's an honorable leader. He follows God. He does what God tells him to do until one day he decided to take matters into his own hand, not wait for the prophet, decided to do an offering all by himself. And when the prophet got there, he showed God's disappointment. And he said, today you've lost your kingdom. This is how David got, got anointed. So that's number two. Number th oh, by the way, this is not the finish that any of us want to accomplish, right? We don't want to accomplish, we don't want to finish poorly. Finish number three, finish so-so. There's a lot of characters who we can uh, exemplify as finishing so-so, but the greatest character is David. David, again, was one of those guys who finished, who started off uh, really strong, was on fire for the Lord, did everything that the Lord told him to do. Uh, you remember his story. He's the one who killed Goliath. He's the one who went up against many battles and won. He's the one who... Uh, always honored God until one time he took his eyes off of God he took his focus off of God he was in a place he shouldn't be and because of his mistake he too could not finish the course that God wanted him to finish let me give you the definition for finishing uh, so so it says this they did not do what they could have done or should have done they, were, they did not complete what God had for them to do. So I, I kind of look at myself and I examine myself. Sometimes I feel like I'm finishing so-so. There are some days where I'm like, man, there is so much more I know I could have done or I should have done but did not do. So I can look back at myself and say, wow, there's, there are some days that I've finished so-so. Now, does that mean I'm a bad guy? Does that mean David you know, didn't make it to heaven, does that mean if, if you feel like you're in that so-so moment that, you know, all is lost and there's no hope for you? Absolutely not. Finishing so-so just means, hey, kick it up a notch. And then that brings us to our final finish, finishing strong. These are the guys who are walking with God all the way up to the end of their lives. They were strong in their faith and close to God all the time. They were not perfect. I know sometimes we look at our Bible heroes and we're like, oh man, that guy was just so good. They were not perfect. Study some of these heroes. You can see some of them were murderers. Some of them were thieves. Some of them were bad guys. Can, can God turn a bad guy's life around? Y you know he can. If, if, he, if I didn't believe that, I wouldn't be here today. And I, could, I know many would uh, say the same thing. But, and there's so many so many examples of good guys who finish strong, like Abraham and Job, Joseph, Joshua, Caleb, Samuel, Elijah, Jeremiah. I'm not going to continue. Last guy in that list is Paul. So many guys who finish strong. Now, now that we have a good reference point, let's go back to that question. How do we finish strong? I think the way to answer that is to simply look at what's in common in these guys in that list what's common in their lives so that we can draw from the commonality and make it ours and make it practical so that you and i can use it today because these these heroes weren't just heroes of their day they're still heroes today they're someone we can look at as an example and say 
you know, I want to I want to live like that. So let's look at some of the similarities. Number one, they trusted God at his word. They had strong faith. Strong faith. Everybody say strong faith. You can do better than that. Strong faith. Thank you. That way I know you're awake. All right. Listen, Abraham, Caleb, great examples from this list, right? Caleb, we know his story. He was one of the 12 guys sent over to go spy out the land. Him and Joshua are the only two guys that come back with a great report. Yeah, yeah, that's good. It's good. It's good. The other 10 guys, disbelief, fear. Uh, no, we can't go. But then Caleb gets up in the midst of them and says something powerful. Look, God says it's ours. Let's take the land now. The people weren't convinced, and we know that story. The whole generation lost out on a promise, but Caleb and Joshua did not. In fact, Caleb's like, I want that land. When they finally crossed over, he says, that's my land over there. And you know what? God honors that. God honors that. Uh, let me move on. Number two, they didn't give up. Even when they made mistakes or when everything was coming against them. I think of Peter. Peter, I relate so much to Peter. He's one of those kind of guys, guys, right? You know, fisherman, brawly dude. I, I, I just picture him as this, you know, drinking beer, you know, up at the pub after a, a day's uh, fishing, you know. Honestly, I, I don't know what his real life was like. I can just kind of imagine and, and I see Peter as this really hard guy who really loved God. And, and we, we know some of his mistakes, right? He, he cut off the ear of the servant when Jesus was being arrested. No, Peter, that's not the right thing. He denied G even knowing Jesus, not just being with him, not just being around him. He said, I do not know him. Denied him three times. But yet... How did Peter finish his life? He was restored, wasn't he? He was restored. And not only was he restored, not only did he repent, but he went on to be one of the greatest leaders, one of the greatest leaders in our Christianity. Um, let's move on to the next one. So number one, they trusted God at his word. They had strong faith. They didn't give up even if they made mistakes or if everything was against them. Oh, by the way, everything against them, right? I got to talk about Joseph. Now, here's a guy, when we read his story, we don't see anything that he really does wrong, do we? We don't see any, any, anything in, in the, the scriptures that tell us that he was a bad guy and that, that turned, his, turned around. No, I think the, his only mistake was telling his brothers the big dream he had, right? And I think his only mistake was being his dad's favorite, right? This caused his brothers to be jealous of him and eventually want to kill him. But God protected him through that. This, this, he, I mean, when he went to Potiphar's house, was he looking to get into trouble? No. Uh, we know it's different because Potiphar put him in charge of everything. You don't get put in charge of everything as a slave if you're doing your job poorly. He must have been doing his job really well, going above and beyond what every other servant was doing, whether they were slave or hired. He showed something that no one else had, and therefore he was made the leader of Potiphar's house. Did he, go, did he go to Potiphar's wife and want anything? No. Again, he was falsely accused. He was in the wrong place at the wrong time. But we know the end of Joseph's story. He saves a nation. He becomes second command in, in all of Egypt and saves the nation of Israel. Amen? Let's move on to the number three. They did what God told them to do even when it didn't make sense. Now, you have to go back to the story of Joshua. We all know this great story of how the walls fell down simply because someone listened to what God said by marching. In the natural sense, if you go tell our soldiers out there today, hey, guys, I want you to march around this city because God has given you the city. But all I want you to do is march. You can carry your, your guns and your rifles. You can carry your ammunition, but you're not going to use it today. You're going to march. And by the way, you're going to do that for the next six days. Oh, OK. 
okay, in the heat, the dust. Oh, and by the way, do you think the people that were standing up on the wall watching this were not jeering at them, maybe making fun of them? I know the Bible says that a lot of them were afraid, so I can imagine a whole bunch of them were in terror inside their homes wondering what is going on. But I, uh, I can also guarantee you that there were those who don't honor God and were up there jeering at them. What are these fools doing? On day seven, it got even worse. Don't march one time, march seven times. And at the end of that march, I want you to blow the trumpets and I want you to shout. Now, I've heard some guys teach this, that the reason why he marched them around all this time because he wanted to soften up the ground. I don't think it had anything to do with softening up the ground. Or I've even heard one guy teach that uh, there was a fault line that went through that area. Uh, come on, are we stretching it a bit or can we just trust in God? I think the greater lesson here is they obeyed God, everything he said, and the walls came tumbling down. And they went straight away inside that city and took that city. Not because of some marching, not because of some trumpet blast and not because of some shouting but because of sheer obedience they got the job done that day they finished well amen uh, last point I'm going to make on this part is they were bold and courageous for God look at Peter and Paul for the examples of this Paul especially I mean come on how many times did the guy have to be beat and put in chains put in prison and every single time he got out, he was still bold for God. He was courageous. So it's simple when we look at this, the, look at the commonality. Uh, it's simple for us to say, okay, yeah, it's easy to say, but it's not always easy to do, right? Good thing we're not alone in this fight. Good thing we're not alone in this march. Let's go back to the story of Derek. Remember Derek's, Derek's story as, as all his hopes seemed to fade away? His dad came to help him. Remember? Now, you don't see it in the video, but his dad had to get through those guards. And he had to get through the track officials to get to his son. In fact, in, in the video, you do see one guy come race, racing up to him to stop him, but his dad just kept right on going. He might have yelled, that's my son, as he's running, but he was kept on going. He didn't stop. See, we have a Heavenly Father. When we're going through troubles, when we're going through hard times, he's right there. He's the one carrying us across the finish line. We cross the finish line every single day. Every single day we have a finish line to cross. How are you going to finish today? I, I've accepted a challenge to ride 100 miles on my bike for kids' cancer. And, and the, the first part of the month, man, I just, it was a struggle. Each day it was a struggle to get on my bike and, and pedal. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm 50 years old this, this year, and I'm, I'm many pounds overweight than I need to be. And I'm riding this bike that has no gear, so every, every crank of that crank is me pushing that bike. Yesterday I finished strong. For, for the first time I felt like I really finished strong for these kids. Because there was a point in, in, in my ride yesterday, I just wanted to give up. I'm like, this is way too darn hard. There was a hill. I had to literally get off my bike and walk it up the hill. And even walking up the hill, I'm like, by the time I got to the top, I'm like. <sighs> oh, literally. I, it, was that, it was that difficult. And then I got back on my bike and I kept going. Something stirred in me and just said, you know what? Finish. Just finish. 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 And I just kept saying that to myself, and I, I did. It was the longest ride I have done since I was 17 years old yesterday. Every day we have a race. Every day we have a finish line to cross. All right. So when you're in the midst of the hard struggles, it's your heavenly father. So John and Austin... And everyone else, and myself included, let's take these simple points to heart and strive to finish each day strong. And I'm going to hit these points one more time. Build up a strong faith. How do you do that? Digging into his word 
Pastor Dave has already said that. Daily, guys. Daily. All right? Don't let this ever be a book that sits on the shelf and collects dust. Basic instructions before leaving earth. Bible. Amen? Number two. Trust God at his word and stay focused on him. Stay focused. I think that's a key right there. Remember Peter? He's in the boat with the disciples. Jesus is walking on the water to them. Everyone else is, ah, it's a ghost, right? I don't know if they screamed like a girl like I just did, but they, they were afraid, right? But Peter, I love this guy. I so relate to him. He says, if that's you, call me out. Come. If you've got enough faith to step out on that boat, come on, brother. Peter steps out of the boat. I know we all remember the end of the part, but can we, can we just focus on a moment there that he literally walked on water? No other human being has ever done that that I'm aware of. Peter walked on the water. What was, what was, his, what was his success there? As long as he kept his eyes on Jesus, as long as his focus was on God, he was walking on the water. You know what? I think if he kept his focus the whole time, Jesus and Peter could have been like arm in arm just walking across the lake while the, while the rest of the disciples are in the boat rowing to keep up with them, right? I don't know. This is the way my mind thinks. I'm just thinking if he had kept his eyes on Jesus the whole time, what could have really happened? And I get excited about that because to me, I just picture walking across that lake arm in arm with Jesus, just chit-chatting. Amen? That's the way I want to be. But as soon as he took his focus off of him, we know what happens. He sinks. Then he cries out, Lord, save me. I'm going to drown. Come on, Peter. You're a fisherman. Swim. As much time as you spent time on the water, that, that's not the point. The point is he took his focus off of God, and he immediately became afraid. When we take our focus off God, when we allow the world's worries and concerns to consume us, we become afraid, right? It's very easy today, if you watch too much YouTube videos like I do sometimes, it's very easy to become afraid with all the end time prophecy stuff that's going on, with all the things that, all the, all the terrible things that are happening in this world. But if we keep our focus on those things, doesn't that produce fear of us? Let's continue to focus, off from the John, focus on Jesus always. All right. Uh, number Next one, learn how to hear God's voice and obey it even when it doesn't make sense. Obey it. Well, I don't know what I'm supposed to be obeying right now. Chances are you probably didn't obey the last thing God said, so maybe you need to ask God, what was the last thing you told me to do? Then go back, accomplish that thing, do what he told you to do, and then you know what? He'll give you your next set of instructions. Just keep in mind, God always has the big picture. He always has the big picture. I've done some things in my life that I felt, God, I don't understand why we're moving here. I don't understand why we're doing this. And, and always in the end, after a short season, I was like, oh, that makes total sense now. I'm glad I listened. But there's also been times when I did not listen. And, the, of course, the consequences were the opposite effect. Oh, I really wish I had listened to you. Anybody been there besides me? Okay. So you know what I'm talking about. Next one. Uh, learn to be bold and courageous for God when you need to be. Now, let me caution you. This is not a license to go out there and argue your point and beat somebody down with the Bible. No, what this really is, it's a call for us. It's a call for us to uh, stand up for the orphans, to stand up for the widows, to stand up for the hurting, to stand up for the lost. And keep in mind, it's always done in love with grace. Grace. Remember that. Uh, and besides, it's, that's Jesus' second command. Love your neighbor as yourself. Next one, stay connected with other believers. This is going to be very key for you two guys, especially as you're, you're stepping out and you're going into college. And not, not that college is a terrible thing. I, I applaud you for, for moving into this next step. But I want to warn you at the same time that as a Christian, not everybody believes the way you believe. I know God's Not Dead is, is an old movie, but I, I think it's very, very good movie because it does bring up a, a great point.
point that, listen, the professors may not agree with your worldview. It doesn't mean you have to succumb to their worldview, though. Stand strong. Be courageous in your faith. Focus on God, and he will guide you in it. I'm going to leave a couple scriptures here, and I'm I'm almost done, I promise. Hebrews 12, 1 through 3, it says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great, uh, huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. And let us run with endurance the race that God has set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Because of the joy awaiting him, Jesus endured the cross, disregarding its shame. Now he is seated in a place of honor beside God's throne. Think of all the hostility he endured from sinful people. Then you will, won't become weary and give up. And then I love this next scripture from Philippians chapter 3, verses uh, 12 through 14. And I'm going to read this one from the, the Living Bible. It says, I don't mean to say I'm perfect. This is Paul speaking. I've learned all, uh, I haven't, let me, let me start again. I don't mean to say that I am perfect. I haven't learned all I should even yet. But I keep working toward the day when I will finally be all that Christ saved me for uh, saved me for and wants me to be. No, dear brothers, I am still not all I should be, but I am bringing all my energies to bear on one thing. Everybody say one thing. Forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. You can't live in the past. What's past is past. I know sometimes I like to go down this road. Oh, if I had just done this. But I got to remember what's in the past is the past. God's asked me to live today. I can live today and finish well. The rest of the verse says, I strain to reach the end of the race and receive the prize for which God is calling us up to heaven because of what Jesus did for us. The, the emphasis here is on what Jesus did. So yes, gentlemen, strive hard. You're smart. You're young and you're strong. Don't, don't, don't think someday that I got here because of my ability. Remember, it's what Christ has done through you. Remember that, okay? And I'm going to leave you with one final story. And uh, I wanted to bring the video, but the, the video brought me to tears so many times I could not bear to watch it again. Um, but this story is, is of another athlete. His name is Terry Fox. He was born in July of 58. He is a Canadian athlete, hum, a humanitarian, a cancer research activist. He is one of the most famous athletes in Canadian history. And guess what, folks? He is not even a hockey player, right? Um, Fox was a distance runner and basketball player for his high school and for the university. At the age of 19, his right leg was amputated after he was diagnosed with uh, osteosarcoma. Though he con- although, even with that, he continued to run with an artificial leg, and he played wheelchair basketball in Vancouver, winning three national championships. Now, I could end the story right there, right? That's pretty amazing. He didn't give up. He continued to fight. But his story doesn't end there. Terry decided that if he was going to go on living, he was going to change something. He was going to make a difference. In 1980, he began the Marathon of Hope, a cross-country run to raise money for cancer research. He hoped to raise $1 for each of, Can- Can- yeah, each of Canada's 24 million people. He began with little fanfare from St. John's in April and ran the equivalent of a marathon each day. How many of you know how, what the equivalent of a marathon is? I'm sorry? 26 miles, that's correct. So every day he ran 26 miles. I can't even walk 26 miles every day, so this is quite a feat. After 143 days and 3,339 miles, his cancer spread to his lungs, and he had to end his quest to run across Canada. He died nine months later in June of 1981. 
But because of what he did, because of his courage and his strength to continue on, he's, a, he's well known and he's a national hero. In fact, he's more well known than Wayne Gretzky. Um, he managed to inspire an entire country in the 80s. His efforts resulted in a lasting worldwide legacy, the annual Terry Fox Run. And some of you may even be familiar with this if you're a runner. First held in 1981, it has grown to involve millions of participants in over 60 countries and is now the world's largest one-day fundraiser for cancer research. Over $650 million has been raised in his name. Isn't that incredible? Isn't that an incredible story? Talk about finishing strong. We can all finish strong. You too can make a difference today, here and now. You don't have to be a preacher and stand up in front of a bunch of people and quote a bunch of verses and tell inspirational stories. You can make a difference right where you're at. You can make a difference as an usher or a greeter. You can make a difference as a children's worker holding babies, working in the nursery. You can make a difference making coffee. You can make a difference as a uh, car salesman. You can make a difference as a teen, as a kid. You can make a difference in every area of life. You don't have to be standing up here. You can make a difference as a musician or a singer. You can make a difference as a police officer. You can make a difference as a student or a teacher or even a retiree. Yes, even our season, ladies and gentlemen, can still make a difference. If you still have breath in you, you can make a difference. The thing that makes some of these stories so uh, powerful and so heart-wrenching is that they found the one thing that they wanted to go after and make a difference in. Each and every one of us has that one thing that God has given us. Each and every one of us has a chance to make a difference. So when you when you go back to that initial verse, First Corinthians nine says, "So run to win." He also talked about at the very end of uh, twenty five. He said, uh, "The athletes they work hard to earn something that fades away, but we work hard." For something that's eternal. What is that eternal for you? That one thing. Gentlemen, you have a plan moving forward, right? That one thing continues to stay that one thing. If you stay focused on God, you won't go wrong. And as Pastor Dave said earlier, you can be a world changer. And I know some people hear that word world and think, well, Come on, you got to be a president. No, a world means the area that around you. What do you have influence over? That's the world that you're in today. So let me pray. Father, we just thank you for this time, and we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that, that in your word we can find comfort and peace, that in your word we can find courage and strength. Lord, I'm just praying that each and every one of us would take this to heart, myself especially included. Lord, I want to finish each day strong. And Lord, I'm looking to you as my source and my strength. Help each and every one of us, Lord, to finish strongly, daily. It's not all about the end of our lives, although it would be nice for us to leave a legacy behind for our kids and our grandkids. But more importantly, we can leave a legacy each day. Each day we can make choices to live strong for you. Father, we just adore you and thank you for today. And it's in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Thank you.